Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for that introduction. And I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Studies and uh, Joseph Benami for inviting me to speak to you this morning. Uh, I see quite a number of familiar faces in the audience, and you'll have to forgive me if what I'm telling or going to talk to you about this morning you know already because you've heard me speak before. Uh, I think immigration and demography are critically important to Canada. Uh, we all boast the, about the fact that we're either the fathers or, or our fathers or grandfathers or our relatives came here as immigrants and we all know I think how important immigration is to Canada. But uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning and express serious concern that uh, since 1990 the, our immigration policy has in my view gone off the rails and uh, we've been taking from 1990 over a quarter of a million or roughly a quarter of a million immigrants uh, each year and uh, if you realize that those quarter of a million are not coming into Canada's population of 33 million but are in fact going to primarily three cities Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver uh, with those three cities have a population base of roughly eight to nine million. Uh, the British House of Lords expressed a <coughs> very serious concern in 2008 that the British annual immigration intake of 190,000 was far too many people coming in to the island. They have a population of over 60 million and they're concerned about 190,000 immigrants. Uh, we've got a quarter of a million coming in every year and uh, I think that's just far too many and there's implications uh, because of the numbers. Uh, we now have a backlog and while well, in 2008 the backlog uh, of people who've already met all of the requirements uh, uh, numbered 950,000 people waiting outside of Canada having met all of the requirements and waiting to come. Uh, Despite that, in that same year, in 2008, uh, on the eve of a recession, our government increased the immigration levels uh, to over a quarter of a million. On top of that, just recently, within the last five years, uh, we've been bringing in almost uh, 200,000. It varies from 170 to 190, sometimes close to 200,000 temporary workers. Uh, they come without any selection. They, have, they don't have to meet any language requirements. They don't uh, have uh, to meet any educational or skill requirements. Most of them are unskilled people. They come in for four years and uh, are asked to leave at the end of the four years. But during their time here, if they're working for Tim Hortons uh, or McDonald's or meat packing plants in Manitoba and they leave the week after they get here, there's no follow-up and the employers are not required to report that they've left their job. Uh, it's highly unlikely that those people will go home. And if after the four years they don't want to go home, all they have to do is walk down the street and claim at the nearest immigration office that they are being persecuted in their own country and want to apply for asylum. Having done that, uh, they will wait for probably three years before they get a hearing before the refugee board. Uh, in the meantime, if they don't want to work, we give them welfare. So they get welfare, free housing, free medical, free dental. And of course, when they do appear, if they do appear at the refugee board, three or four years later, they get free legal advice. So uh, in my view, the, the whole immigration refugee uh, policy is off the rails, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. And I've got a lot to say, so I, I won't be able to tell you everything I would like to, but I'll cover the main points. And I'm going to start off with uh, reading a statement by Minister Kenny, the Minister of Immigration, Citizenship and Immigration, on May the 11th of this year. He said, uh, as they were announcing the even higher immigration levels for next year, uh, he announced those in a press release in which uh, Kenny st said that the, and I quote now, the government is maintaining immigration levels to meet short, medium, and long-term economic needs, help our aging population and low birth rate, and sustain our workforce. 
Now, in that statement, you find the three great myths of immigration that's formed the foundation of our policy since really 1990, and its justification for the uh, thousands of people we're bringing here. Economy, labor force, and aging. I'm going to just talk briefly about each of those, because those are myths. There is not truth to, them, to any three of them. Let's take the economy. Every economic study, serious one, that's been done in Canada uh, since the end of the war has not indicated that there is any significant gain to the economy through immigration. The first one was the McDonald Royal Commission report in the early 80s that did an extensive study on this subject and concluded that immigration doesn't have any significant impact on the economy or on economic growth. Then we had the Economic Council report of 1889-90. Uh, the Economic Council is now uh, uh, defunct, it was dissolved, but it did good work in those days. And its report in 1989-90 found the same, or came to the same conclusion, that immigration has very insignificant impact on the Canadian economy. Uh, then that was followed by a uh, Department of Health and Welfare study uh, two years later. Same conclusion. Uh, George Boris, 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 sorry, Boris, who's a uh, probably the best known and renowned immigration economist in the world from Harvard and an immigrant himself from Cuba has made a lifetime study on the impact of immigration on, on the U.S. economy. And he's also a, did a study on the uh, immigration in Canada. Conclusion, the same as the others. Immigration does not have any significant impact on economic growth or sustainability. Uh, I could go on. I mentioned the House of Lords study in 2008 in July did an extens extensive study on the impact that immigration was having in England and concluded that the government was using the argument of economic growth, labor force enhancement, and aging as a cover-up to bring in thousands of immigrants that were not needed and were causing great economic difficulties in the, in the United Kingdom and chastised the labor government for doing so and recommended, as I said, that the 190,000 immigrants going into England should be drastically cut back. So uh, there's lots of evidence that immigration doesn't really have any impact on the economy. What about the labor force? Very much the same thing. Uh, Boreas says, argues that, of course, if you've taken Economics 101 and had Samuelson's uh, book on economics, uh, the more labor you have, of course, the, the uh, uh, wages paid to them go down. And he says that applies, of course, to immigration. If you bring in large numbers of immigrants, whether they're unskilled or skilled, you're going to reduce wages of the, of the local population. Uh, Boris says there's some winners, not they don't all lose, the winners are employers who can hire cheaper labor. Uh, but he questions the need for bringing in foreign labor. Uh, certainly in the United States, they don't need it, he argues. And he argued that we don't need it here. We may have needed it when we had a large land mass and the prairies were uninhabited. But now we have 33 million people in a very narrow, actually, land space, if you look carefully. And in the top of that, globalization has ruled out the need for a higher consumer base that used to be one of the valid arguments for immigration in Canada. Um, Andrew Green from Queen's University did a study three or four years ago in which he argued the same thing about the labor force. I'd like to just read you what, what his study finally concluded, because it's, it's a good statement. He, he concluded that, and I quote, immigration of any acceptable level will not solve problems like the aging of the population or regional inequality. It is also the case that we now have, an edu we now have educational facilities to meet our domestic needs for skilled workers in all but extreme circumstances. Immigration is not the panacea for all of our problems. He went on to say that the current political posture of using immigrants to solve economic problems is no longer valid. Uh, again, there are, there are Stats Canada statistics studies have also shown that immigrants are not helping our labor force. And I guess the proof of the pudding is that the immigrants who have arrived in Canada uh, since 1990 are not doing well. Over 52% of them are living below the poverty line. 
They're not earning the wages that Canadian workers are earning. They're not doing nearly as well as the immigrants who were coming prior to 1990. Uh, there are reasons for that, and I'll explain them a little later on. But the point is that if immigrants are not helping us, from, from an economic point of view, are not helping us, uh, or are not helping enhance the labor force, what about the aging? That's the greatest myth of all, of course. Uh, there hasn't been a demographer anywhere in the world who would argue that immigration helps or can help the aging. Uh, the OECD has, set, has done several studies on that. Uh, the Department of Health and Welfare study I mentioned indicated clearly. If you bring in a quarter of a million people into a population base of 33 million, and the age structure of the quarter of a million that you're bringing in is the same as the 33 million, then you're not helping anything. Uh, if anything, it's, it's aggravating it because among the 250,000 we bring in are 20 or 25,000 aged parents and grandparents. So aging cannot help. Uh, C.D. Howe has uh, instituted, has done a study, I think last year, that concluded the same thing. That if, you, if Canada wanted to have any impact on our aging through immigration, we'd have to probably bring in 7 million a year. And even then, it would be an insignificant uh, drop in in our aging. But we continue to hear the argument that we are, we're going to need immigrants for our labor force because the labor force is shrinking. And I think that's probably true. But what France has done or is trying to do is uh, what most labor force economists argue is the best approach. That is to simply increase the age of retirement from 60 to 62. And that alone, and uh, the Stats Canada study, I think by PICO, has demonstrated one year's increase on the age of retirement in Canada would solve a lot of our labor force problems. So these are the three myths of immigration and we keep being bombarded by those myths. Uh, uh, not only do our government spokespeople tell us this, all of the political parties want more immigrants. Most of the media and certainly the CBC supports mass migration and argues on every program that, you know, immigration is good for us. Uh, immigration is probably good for us. I mean, it's, I'm not arguing, and I don't think anybody in the organization that I belong to would argue that uh, we are opposed to immigration. But why are we bringing in so many immigrants if it isn't help, if immigration is not helping us? We're bringing them in because all of the political parties see immigrants as potential voters. And that's the real, it's as simple as that. Uh, <coughs> That's the unvarnished truth about our immigration policy. We're bringing in those people because our polit polit political parties feel they can manipulate the ethnic vote. Uh, and there may be some truth to that, but I don't think that's a valid reason for bringing in uh, immigrants who are not doing well. They're not finding jobs. Uh, why aren't they? I, I wanted to come back to that. They're not finding jobs because, because the numbers are so high our, our visa officers abroad, whose job it was in the past to interview immigrants and to select those that they felt could come to Canada and could get employed and on their own within a year of arrival. That was the objective uh, that the visa officer was looking for when he was interviewing immigrants. And he had a point system that guided him in making that decision. So it wouldn't be purely subjective. But they were left with the authority to make judgments on to whether the person they were interviewing, if they felt for good reasons that these people would not be able to get jobs, uh, they could refuse them. They had discretionary authority. Uh, they no longer have that. And now they don't even Im interview immigrants. There are so many of them that immigrants are not being interviewed. Can you believe that? Can you imagine any Canadian employer in Canada hiring someone without interviewing them? The vast majority of immigrants are not interviewed. Uh, if you are in Bangladesh and you want to submit an application to come to Canada, you fill out the forms with the help probably of an agent and a lawyer. You, it's sent, those forms are sent to London. A junior officer will survey the forms and if everything is in order, will issue the visa from London to Bangladesh. People are not being seen. Uh, I mean, not only does this have serious security implications, that's another thing as a matter of fact, because again we're bringing in so many people, the security forces can't possibly uh, 
survey the, the numbers that have come in and, making a, and make a good security decision. One in ten uh, in Pakistan, one applicant out of ten get a, gets a security check. And uh, we know that uh, Pakistan and so many of the other countries are producing terrorists, but we're not paying much attention to that. Uh, so if they're not being interviewed, that's one of the reasons. The other reason, of course, is in, in the 90s, we switched away from selecting immigrants because they had trades, skills, and occupations that we needed, and switched to say, uh, we switched the, from occupational skills and demands in Canada for skills and training to education. And we weighted the point system very heavily in favor of people that have, had, have been going to school for a long time. And if you went to school for uh, 25 years or so, uh, you got 25 points. Uh, it didn't matter what school you went to. So you, you graduated from Harvard or Columbia or University of, of uh, Manchester or any university of standing, you got the same number of points if you, if you graduated from a very small college in, uh, in somewhere in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, so uh, the educational equivalencies hasn't worked for us. And uh, the reason a lot of people that are coming here who have been well educated and as, as the myth has it, are driving cabs, is because they're not qualified. Uh, Australia would not let a professional immigrant into their country until they know that the architect or the uh, engineer that wants to go to Australia, they insist that they have to be able to prove that they already can be licensed in Australia to practice their profession. Otherwise, they can't come. They have to as well be fluent in English. We don't bother with that. Uh, if the fellow had 25 years of education and meets his the number of points, he comes in, and we know damn well he won't be able to practice. Uh, and when he arrives, he's not a very happy camper because he finds that he has to go through, rewrite all of his exams, uh, has to go through all sorts of uh, licensing requirements. And in the professions, those are, those are tough licensing requirements to meet, and rightly so. Uh, you don't want someone uh, performing surgery that you're not absolutely sure he's going to do it properly. So. Uh, uh, we ma we've made a lot of mistakes, and the swing over to uh, the selection criteria, the lack of interviewing people, and the emphasis on numbers alone uh, has turned the whole immigration business into an assembly line, uh, concentrating on numbers. The people abroad, the officers abroad, some of whom I know, all bemoan this and say the whole thing is a mess. All we're interested and told to do is get our targets, issue the visas, get them in. Uh, this is not a good way to run an immigration uh, service. And uh, that's why uh, a lot of people are concerned about it, and uh, rightly so. That's why I've been speaking out about it. Uh, now, how am I doing here? Uh, I, I could say lo much more about it. Uh, one of the other things that people don't want to talk about, but I think it's critically important, and that is if you bring in s such large numbers, in a concentrated area of three cities in Canada, you change the demographics of those cities very rapidly. And uh, Toronto now has almost 50% foreign born. Vancouver is getting close to, for, it's over 40% now, I think. Uh, most of the immigrants that are coming into those cities now are from Asia. Uh, the immigrants that are coming in certainly from China uh, are doing reasonably well, those that are selected, because uh, they're well educated, they have a work ethic, and they do well, and they send their children to school, and they put a great emphasis on education. But if you look at the figures and do your projections, uh, there is no question that Toronto and Vancouver will be Asian cities, uh, probably by the year 2030, certainly by 2050. Now, a lot of people say, well, so what? Uh, I don't say so what, I say, well, we surely don't have an obligation to turn our cities into Asian cities. Uh, why, why should we do that without at least discussing it, debating it? There are pros and cons to that argument, but uh, it's something that Canadians are afraid to talk about. Uh, they may talk about it at cocktail parties, or they may say, look, I was on the subway in Toronto and you know, I couldn't believe what's happening. There, were, there was nobody there but people that uh, obviously are immigrants. 
but no one discusses it logically. There are implications to it, not only demographically, uh, but socially, and also from a security point of view. Uh, you know, the implications from a security point of view are hard, hard to figure out, but uh, the Chinese government looks upon all of the Chinese immigrants as overseas Chinese. Uh, and they expect these people to be, continue to be loyal to China. And that may not be a threat, and I don't think it is a threat, but who knows what might happen in the future. And we should be at least giving some thought to these issues. They, there are implications to immigration. It's not the, you know, the happy old story that these people come in, they work hard, they succeed, and the kids get on into the second generation and do well. Uh, that was the case. It's not the case now. All of a sudden in Parkdale in, in Toronto, you suddenly find that there's 150 young Roma children coming to school, uh, speaking no English. Uh, you, you do, as they have done in Parkdale, get uh, Hungarians, Magyar speaking people to come in and help the children adjust until they can learn English. And you find that the parents of these Roma children don't want their children to have anything to do with Hungarian speaking people who are living in Toronto. Uh, they want Roma teachers. Uh, this, this creates a, 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 you know, a daily tough problem for school teachers in, in Parkdale. Uh, the policymakers in Ottawa aren't giving much thought to that. Uh, we are taking very large numbers of Roma people from Hungary. They're getting on the planes every day coming here. Uh, these people can travel freely anywhere in the European Union. Uh, they, they are citizens of Hungary. So they can travel anywhere they want to in the European Union. Uh, they're coming to Canada. Why? Because all they have to do is say, look, we're being persecuted, and they are in. Uh, so before I close, I want to give you a few words about our dysfunctional asylum system. I mean, that, that's almost as bad or probably worse than the immigration mess we're in. Uh, we, let me give you a figure. In 2008, we took 37,000 asylum speaker, seekers. Remember, these are not refugees, as they are often described in the media. These are people who claim they're being persecuted in their own country. In 2008, of the 37,000 that we brought in, we brought in people from 188 different countries. Uh, of the 27 European Union countries, we had asylum claims from 22 of those. The third, I think, largest number of asylum seekers in 2008 were Americans. Uh, now, we have a wide open system. There's no other country in the world that allows anyone from any country to come in and say, I'm being persecuted in my own country and I need help, I need assistance, I need asylum. We invite them in. We say to them, as, we've, as I told you before, that you can work if you want to, but if you don't work, we will give you welfare, free housing, free medical, free dental, and if you have your children with free education. Uh, oh yes, and don't forget, uh, two years from now or so, when you have to go for your appointment to the refugee board, uh, you will get free legal advice. And if they turn you down and you happen to want to appeal to the courts, uh, we'll we'll pay for your legal fees as well. Uh, and that's what's happening. So in addition to that, we're not sending any of them home anyway, even if they fail, if they're found, and 60% are found not to be genuine refugees. You know, a lot of them are young people from California who claim they're persecuted because they can't smoke pot in California. Maybe they will be able to after this next r referendum. But uh, while well, I you've seen recently the, the Quaid couple that are here the, uh, claiming, uh, they'll probably uh, uh, get a hearing, but the, you know, the hearing will be uh, two or three years from now. I think the government will do their damnedest to make sure the Quades don't, because it's a case like the Quades and the Tamil boats that, that get the public a little bit aroused, and that's the last thing the politicians want you to do. Uh, you know, the Tamil boat gets a lot of attention, and you know, the lawyers uh, who are, you know, there's a battalion of Toronto lawyers sped to Victoria when that Tamil boat arrived, because uh, they make a lot of money out of the refugee asylum system, and so do a lot of others. The reason we haven't changed our asylum policy, which has been in a mess since, since 1990, is because there's a very powerful refugee lobby out there. Immigration lawyers, immigration consultants, they make a lot of money representing these people. 
the Canadian Council of Refugees, an umbrella organization that has many, many uh, non-governmental groups and uh, agencies uh, working with asylum seekers, get millions of dollars from the government every year to look after these people. Uh, the Canadian Council of Churches want new adherence to their particular religion. They're always ready to shelter some guy in the basement of the church if by any chance we actually were going to deport him, which is very seldom. Uh, uh, advocacy groups, Amnesty International, uh, Open Borders, uh, these are the people the government listens to. Why? Because they're the only ones, pretty well, who appear at the House of Commons Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration. They're there in, in hordes, ready to give every argument to tell parliamentarians that these poor people, if you send them back, will suffer torture and death. Uh, I don't think we've ever sent anyone back to any country where they've been tortured or, or put to death. Uh, so, what's the problem with this? The problem is that very many, there are many problems associated with that. One, it hurts the taxpayer. Let's take the 37,000 in 2008 who came in. Kenny, the minister, tells us that each failed asylum seeker costs $50,000. All right, do the math. 60% of the 37,000 are going to fail. So 60% of 37,000 times $50,000, that equals in 2008, $1.11 billion. And the costs are not only for the failed asylum seeker, those asylum seekers who are found to be refugees also cost us. And uh, that's 2008. In uh, the following year, in 2009, we only had 33,000 come in. But if you do the calculations, and, and nobody can really tell you how much it costs us because the government doesn't want you to know, the 50,000 figure they tell you about, they don't tell you what's been taken into account for that figure, and they don't tell you if it's an annual figure or a one-shot effort. But we do know that uh, the provincial governments, the municipal governments, and the federal governments have to spend, I say, two to three billion dollars a year on, on refugee, uh, refugee system. Uh, I don't call them refugees because they're not, they, in Europe they call them asylum seekers because they recognize that they're not. Our board, and we'll hear more about our board, I hope, from the Immigration and Refugee Board, from uh, Julie Taub, who's going to be speaking after me. Uh, she can tell you something about that. But if I had any reform to recommend, it would be to do away with the Refugee Board. Uh, they're political appointees for, for the most part. Uh, they come, a lot of them come from uh, refugee organizations, NGOs that help refugees, ethnic organizations. Many of them are amateurs. Many of them have never been out of Canada. They've never been in a refugee camp. Uh, while we spend two to three billion dollars on, on our 30 to 40,000 asylum seekers who come in every year, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is responsible for 43.3 million refugees and others under his care. Do you know what his budget is this year? 2.1 billion dollars to look after 43.3 people that are in camps. They're in dreadful conditions. I've been in them. The shelter is rotten. The food is rotten. They're being raided by armed gangs in many cases. Uh, some of them have been in there for five years in camps. They're mainly elderly people and women and children. Uh, we don't help them much. We're spending all our time and attention on a handful of so-called people who want asylum here for the wrong reasons. We give $45 million to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees as our share to help him look after the real refugees in the camps abroad. So it's a mess and it has to be corrected, but it's unlikely to make much progress there because you've seen with Kenny's new smuggling bill, which isn't going to help much in, on the front end. The, the bill won't enable us to catch smugglers. The smuggling that goes on and a lot of the asylum seekers that are coming here are coming in through smuggling. They pay smugglers to get them here. They are not victims. They are people who often solicit the asylumers, asylum, uh, the smugglers. They go out and try and find people who will get them into Canada if they pay them money to do so. Uh, we have Olivia Chow, the immigration critic for the NDP, arguing very strongly that 
And Justin Trudeau was arguing, you know, well, the bill should concentrate on catching the smugglers, leave the poor victims alone. They are not victims. Most of them are, have relatives here. And the fast way to get in here, if you have a relative, is to get a smuggler to get you on an aircraft bound to Canada. Why wait in the backlog? It's 900,000 people there. You wait for years. Uh, not only that, if you're an uncle, a niece, a nephew, a cousin, you're not eligible to be sponsored. So the thing to do is to come in as an asylum seeker. If you have relatives here, they, you will not be sent home. They know that. Uh, so we've become the country of choice for human smuggling. The smugglers are highly sophisticated international criminal organizations, Russian mafia, Chinese tri triads, and they don't operate out of Canada. They live in Istanbul or Shanghai, and you'll never catch them. First of all, they're too smart. Secondly, you'll never get grounds to, to prosecute them. You might catch the captain of a, of a ship and uh, nail him, but he probably is, you know, he's an entrepreneur. He's pay getting paid to bring people to Canada. Uh, well, the thing is a mess. I've told you a bit of the unvarnished truth. There's lots more to talk about, but uh, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Sorry, I, I am available for questions, yes. I forgot that. How are we running for time, uh, Bruce? Uh, we, have, uh, we have 10 minutes. If we stay on, if we stay on schedule, we have 10 minutes. Um, You've noticed some uh, bright lights today. Uh, CPAC is taping this, and uh, it's exciting. We'll get uh, wonderful coverage. Uh, one of the consequences of that, though, is that if you could please go to the microphone here, um, that will give you a good, clear voice into the CPAC record. And I'll also pass you this microphone. And between the two, uh, we'll have us taped and ready for our Hollywood edition. Um, perhaps uh, to get things going, if I might ask the first question. Um, and it's a difficult one, I think. Uh, Mr. Desette, it's, uh, I'm wondering about the politics of all of this. And uh, I'm wondering what Canadian, a new Canadian, let's call it, uh, think about our immigration policies. And uh, I even perhaps think that uh, new Canadians are just as disturbed as calling old Canadians <laughs> and uh, would be quite happy to see uh, some uh, much more restrictive policies in place that will uh, allow us to uh, bring the numbers down and make a better control of the portion. Uh, have you seen any studies on this? Um, do you hold any opinions about uh, new Canadians? We do, we did see that uh, Rob Ford, the new mayor of Toronto, uh, received most of his votes from, or a lot of his votes from new Canadians. And yeah. uh, certainly his perspective on life were, were strong and conservative. Yes, I, well, I don't think there have, as far as I know, there haven't been any studies, but I think the election of the new mayor in Toronto is an indicator that uh, politicians make mistakes about assuming that immigrants to Canada are dumber than the rest of Canadians. Uh, they're not. They share the same concerns. They share the same values for the most part. Uh, and of course they're concerned. Uh, they're concerned about it. Uh, but the politicians, you know, also look at statistics, and they have found that, you know, in 1981, there were six communities in Canada that were defined by StatsCan as ethnic enclaves. StatsCan de uh, defines an ethnic enclave as any community in Canada that has 30% of a particular ethnic group, uh, not, not English and French. In 1981, there were six of those across Canada. Uh, today, or sorry, 2004, it'll be a higher figure today, but in 2004, there were 254 communities in Canada designated as ethnic enclaves. So the politicians know that, and they know that if they, you know, if they're careful enough, uh, they can marshal ethnic votes 
or they think they can, uh, to vote in blocks. And there has been some indication that that's been successful in the past, and I think they'll continue to, to believe that. But your underlying assumption that the, uh, the older immigrants that have come here are really beginning to get concerned about uh, our policies. And the governments bribe, of course, ethnic groups. I mean, I, I have the figure here. Uh, I think in, in the 2010-2011 estimates, 712, 712 million dollars have been set aside to hand out to various ethnic groups and uh, agencies in Canada that are supposed to be helping immigrants get settled. Uh, that's a lot of money. It's certainly, uh, you know, in prior to 1990, the Department of Citizenship and Immigration had very little money for, for, for they weren't doing that. They had money to help the odd immigrant who got into trouble the first year, but it was very modest. Uh, but now the, these organizations, uh, I, ha I could give you an indication that uh, from October to December of last year, over 25,000 groups and agencies and NGOs in Canada received in excess of $1 million each. Uh, and some of them got much more significant. In Ottawa, the groups that look after immigrants in, in Ottawa got $9.5 million. Uh, there was a South Asian community in, in Toronto got $13 million. So, yeah. Uh, it's, the politicians want immigrants because they feel they can manipulate the immigrant vote, the ethnic vote. But I think you're quite right. I think that, that that's probably a mistake because the people are, the immigrants are not, as I say, any dumber than the average Canadian is. <laughs> Long answer, I'm afraid. Joe, let me, let me cause a discordant note here. Um, Joe, you have to be careful. So let me ask you this, I mean, I know, uh, if you would possibly want to uh, say your answer would be candidate, but here is the situation we are faced with. And I have to face them in the academic world in some sense. We are the second largest country in the world, five times so, not so with my brother the snow, but we are the second biggest country in the world, and the population of Canada will fit in the city where I was born, a little more in the suburbs of where I was born, that's Calcutta. <laughs> Why should you, in the 21st century, be privileged to hold this real estate and exclude the world's people who need home, who need place, who need shelter, who need food, and as we are shrinking in every single way, how will you argue, how will a politician argue in the world forum? And that's what, in, in a sense, we are faced with. Yeah. Are we the selfish, bigoted, redneck people that were raw for in Toronto, you know? I, yeah. of course, am living in Toronto for 25 years, and I'm the <laughs> word for it. But that's beside the point. I think this is one of the critical issues we are facing, and we do not have an answer to the figures. No, I mean, uh, I, I welcome that question because it's, it's a very good one. But I think the simple answer is that, uh, you know, what, what profit or gain c could anybody have if we emptied the city of Calcutta and brought them here? That's not the way to resolve the problems of the developing world. Uh, India is doing a pretty good job alone in solving that problem. Uh, and they're solving it by not sending their people out they're solving it by educating their people and, and competing in, in the world. Uh, and that's, I think, the answer. You, you, migration cannot solve uh, overpopulation. Uh, there's a great novel called The Camp of the Saints by a Frenchman who, who really, in a novel, outlines the problem you've presented, the ethical problem. And uh, uh, thousands of rafts were bringing uh, almost all of sub-Sahara Africa to France. What to do? This is the core of the novel. Uh, do you sink them or do you let them land? Uh, it's a Hobson's choice. In the novel, they land and of course, France is destroyed in six weeks. So it's the lifeboat theory in a sense. No, I think the way that Canada can, can effectively help the developing world is through developmental aid that's done properly and by encouraging these countries to, 
to better help themselves and solve their problems. In addition to that, I th and I didn't touch on this in my talk, and I, I, I left it out because it's a subject complicated in itself, and that's the environmental problem. If, uh, if it's true by the United Nations projections of population that by uh, 2050 we're going to have uh, 10 or so billion people on the earth, uh, only about 3 billion of those live well, as we do here, as you say, we live well, we have our Cabernet Sauvignon for dinner and so forth. Uh, the rest of the world, even now, uh, there's three to four billion people who go to bed very hungry every night. Uh, we can't solve the problem by bringing them here. The problem is a serious one, but uh, uh, the fact that our birth rate is down, and the birth rate is down in many, many countries, including in the developing world, I see as a good sign. I don't see that as a bad sign. Mother Earth only has a, a certain amount of resources, and we're rapidly cleaning them up. Uh, three last questions. Thanks, and we'll, we'll let it go over time. Oh, hi. I'm, I'm, I personally think if you want to help people of the world, you can solve our trade barriers. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the old days, we used to go to these refugee camps and pick out people and bring them home. Um, are we doing that anymore? Yes, we still are. We used to, we won the Nansen Prize in 1986 for doing that because in, in, originally we didn't see ourselves as a country of first asylum. Where were the refugees fleeing persecution coming, going to come from? The United States. Otherwise, they had to go through Europe and other places where they too could apply for asylum in those places. Uh, so we concentrated on burden sharing. We went into the countries of first asylum, such as Thailand, such as Austria, and took out from those camps refugees to ease their burden, the burdens that the asylum countries were having with so many people, and brought them to Canada. And we did that with the Hungarians, with the Czechs, with the Chileans, with the Ugandan Asians, and we had a fine record in doing that. But you see, in the mid-80s, we started to get a flow of asylum seekers, mostly coming from Europe. Uh, you know, the first Tamil boat that arrived here in 1986 off the coast of Newfoundland with 55 Tamils, they came from Germany. They'd been living in Germany. Uh, but in Germany, they don't treat asylum seekers quite the same way we do. And Germany had its own problems. In 1992, Germany got 434,000 asylum seekers. The following year, they got 300 and some thousand, and that year they changed their constitution. Because at that time, Germany had a wide open system almost almost as generous as our present one. So they changed their constitution. No, I think that's a very good point. I mean, uh, as I say, we, we don't want to talk about it very much. We, we are being brainwashed into thinking that multiculturalism and, and diversity are ends in themselves, which I don't think they are. Uh, and, you know, diversity is fine, and, and we, you know, everybody that praises diversity talks about the number of different restaurants you can go to and get different types of food. Uh, and there's some truth in that as well. But uh, at some point, and I'm not sure where, what, what point, I should say, does diversity mutate into colonialism? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer. Master, listen. Um, the big challenge we face here is the political argument to change the system. Prime Minister Stephen Harper and his cabinet and his ministers and the conservative party today argue that they must pander, they must seek to build, as you call it, ethnic vote banks in order to win a majority in Canada and then to change the system. Is that the right way to go? Well, I think that's one way to go, I suppose, but I think a better way to go is for the government to be honest and all the political parties to be honest. And 
really know what they're talking about when they argue that uh, we need a quarter of a million immigrants every year for economic labor force and aging issues. Uh, we, they're not transparent. Uh, they don't come forth and tell us the truth about immigration. Uh, there is no serious debate in Parliament. There isn't a political party that will touch it with a 10-foot pole. So you can't have a rational, sensible debate about it, uh, as we're, we're having today. It's, it's just not discussed. Uh, you have a media, particularly the CBC, that again uh, is pro-immigration and will not really analyze the, the, the problem or have sensible discussions about it. If there's anyone that's ever going to be deported from Canada, it's headline news in all of the Canadian media. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, a serious problem. I don't know. Maybe the way to go is to, uh, the way that Benami here and the organization, the Center for Policy Studies, uh, are going. And that's why this new organization that we set up, and I'm a member of the advisory board of it, uh, the Canadian Center for Immigration Policy Reform, we are set up and trying, with the aid of other organizations, slowly, quietly, sensibly, to alert the Canadian public to the real issues in immigration and get them to think about it, because nobody ever discusses it openly. Just a quick follow-up. Why should the Conservatives not be able to do what the Liberals and NDPs have done, to build their own ethnic vote banks to win the majority? Well, again, why? I don't know why, but I, I think I know why. Uh, Look, in Canada, I think it's, it's a serious thing. We, we are, we've built up and are slowly building up and reinforcing a political culture that is really driven by, by special interest groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's the special interest groups that get the attention, and it's the mass of Canadians who quietly stand by and let them do it. Uh, I think, you know, politicians react for only one reason. They react if they're frightened. If they're not frightened, they don't do anything. So the thing to do is to get them frightened and demand that we start discussing some of these major issues of public policy sensibly and openly and debate them in Parliament rather than asking silly questions during the questioning period. 